order to be more accountable, in order to be more effective, but we do so by our choice. So I repeat, for the Congregationalist, the basic meaning of the word church is your local congregation. The second meaning of the word church refers to the collective experience of all Christians all over the world throughout time since Jesus founded this movement in his day. Every baptized Christian in every denomination, every non-denominational, as the evangelicals like to call themselves, we are all sisters and brothers in the faith. As they, like us, try to follow Jesus, relying on the power of the Holy Spirit to do so. See, in that regard, there's only one church universally, and its head is Jesus Christ. While Edith and Jean and I were down in the meeting in Kalamazoo, we had a chance to meet other UCC folks from around the state. We got to confer about church business. We got to celebrate worship together. We got to acknowledge one another's contributions to the denomination. We got awarded for being one of the top per capita giving churches in our denomination, hello. We, we got together to collaborate, share ideas, to encourage and to equip one another for ministry. And we heard reports about six resolutions and pronouncements asking local congregations to study and act upon a variety of topics. I said something about them to the board of directors on Monday night, and I'll mention them to you in a moment. That's the one that we have paper. If you're interested in it, there's a write-up of them in the hallway. But please remember, as I mentioned them to you, they have no power over us as a local church. There's no hierarchy implied. Just because some group passes a pronouncement and asks us to study something, we can choose to or not to. Neither from the national nor the state setting are we told what we have to do. Every expression of the church, the local congregation, the association, the conference, the national setting, they are all covenanted to respect one another as equals. In other words, they cannot mandate anything to us any more than we can mandate anything to them. We are free to make our own decisions. We are free to take our own actions. On that Sunday two weeks ago, before I went to the Michigan conference, I said I would talk a bit more this morning about our 850,000 member denomination. Now it's less than a million compared to 12 million Presbyterians and. 25 million Southern Baptists and, and 58 million Catholics. We're just 850,000. And I'm going to speak about why I think it's good for society to have churches like ours. In other words, I want us to reflect on what churches do for the culture in general, not just what we personally get out of it, what we privately feel. And frankly, I think that's more affirming than to listen to pronouncements or make resolutions. First thing I see is church is a place to become aware of moral dimension, the moral dimension. Morality is an aspect of everything we do. It's not simply a list of these are do's and these are don'ts. You see, morality, the moral dimension, is that aspect of our behavior that affects someone else. If what we do has no consequence to anybody else, nobody's going to even notice if I do it or I don't do it, then there's no moral issues involved. However, if our behavior affects even one other person, there's a moral dimension. If it, if it works to their good, we call it moral. If it works to their harm, it's immoral. In church, we talk about that stuff. We talk about what's right and what's wrong. We talk about making moral choices. And Jesus put it very simply. He says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Right? If the situation were reversed. We ask people to consider their basic values. There's not a lot of places in society that do that, but church does that. We teach the Ten Commandments and the Golden Rule. We focus on core values, such as the lawyer was asking about in this morning's scripture reading that, that Jay Kettler read for us. Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus responded, well, what's written in the law? You're a lawyer. How do you read it? Jesus put it right back on the man's own core value system. And he said, you love the Lord your God wholeheartedly, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. And you love your neighbor like you love yourself. And I think Jesus said, bingo, <laughs> Yahtzee. Well said, just do that. 
See, churches engage in conversations like that. We help shape basic social values. We articulate human rights and we pass them along from one generation to the next. It's so exciting to have eight or nine kids here this morning. Education is important in our United Church congregational tradition. After all, Jesus himself was a teacher. He spent most of his ministry sharing new values that he said represents the kingdom of God at hand, the kingdom of God in the world. He was shaping his society in a better direction. That was his ministry. And he told his disciples, the outward appearances are not as important as your inner convictions. Don't be a hypocrite. He said genuine leadership is expressed by greater service, not by how much you have power over others, but how much you serve others. He said loving God and loving one's neighbor as yourself are the greatest of all the biblical commandments. Church people, because of these moral commitments that there be a just world for all people, have spoken out in the past against racism and sexism, against ageism and economic classism. In many situations, churches have made political difference, as did our United Church in court cases about 10 years ago. They fought to allow equal marriage rights to all Americans, regardless of their gender. And that passed the Supreme Court. A great celebration at the General Synod when it did. Now while I and many others hold the opinion that the social programs of modern government, which spend your tax dollars very freely on things they believe in very deeply, have largely nullified the importance and influence of the church as a helpful organization. They look for the government to do the bailouts, not the churches. They look to the government to do the welfare programs, not the churches. They look to the government to reform health care, not the churches. And yet church people are ready to serve. A great core of volunteer civic effort arises and expresses from church members. Our programs are not bound by government regulations. The things we do in the church are not dependent upon public legislation. We are free to do as we choose to do the way we do it as much as we want to do it. Church members give their own money freely and they commit their own time and talents to causes that we believe in. Churches fill the inevitable gaps such as we did here in Alpena for two years. We were buying the drug kits for the drug court participants because the federal funding was withdrawn. And rather than close or burden the, the, the clients themselves, we picked up the tab for drug tests for two years. We provided spiritual counsel for the addicts, both as individual Christians and as a congregation. We are known in the 12-step area as the place to go for spiritual care. Churches are free to act with care and concern in very effective ways because we do it together. And from our faith perspective, we always feel we're doing the right thing. It has to be done by somebody. Nobody's doing it. We'll do it. The church in general is a keeper of values. It's a helpful service organization, and it's a place where you can belong. Church is a place where you meet people. Deep friendships have been made and maintained in local churches. Just look around you at the people here, or if there's an empty pew beside you, you remember the friend that used to sit there. Companionship. During a regular work week, people are so wrapped up in their personal and family world, they don't want neighbors or others butting in. They don't have time for it. It's often hard to really belong anywhere except in your own family or at your workplace. But when you join a church, you choose to be with other people who feel much the way you do about things. It's like an extended family. New aunts and uncles, new siblings and grandparents. I mean, just yesterday, when I baptized Levi Straley, I said, we just got a new little brother in the church. Levi's one of us, too. My image of the church, which is rooted in the experiences here in Alpena, as well as more than 30 years of ministry elsewhere, is a very positive image. It thrives on the notion that we are doing good in many people's personal lives, as well as trying to do good in general, as a keeper of values, as an organization that does good in the community. That's what the, the Comstock Fund meeting is going to be about tomorrow. We're a place to belong to. We're a place to find spiritual meaning in life. Now, if you're interested in the topics of those six recent UCC pronouncements, here they are. You can take them or you can leave them. 
abolish private prisons, such as the new private for-profit immigrant detention center that is being created in Baldwin, Michigan. Address the reality of global forced migration, including the underlying attitudes of racism, xenophobia, and bigotry. Stop using plastic foam products. Registered trademark, styrofoam. Denounce acts of violence and racism that are carried out by white supremacist hate groups. Declare support for the Green New Deal as proposed by Democrats in Congress. And consider encouraging a plant-based life, that is, going vegan. These are today's efforts to be on the cutting edge. These are today's efforts to be the first and still feel that you're being faithful. May the Holy Spirit guide us in such matters. Amen.